The Tom Woods Show, episode 589. Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. All right, everybody, come on now. Here's an easy way to make 25 smackers. You ready? You head over to TomWoods.com slash Ebates, where you get cash rebates for almost all your online purchases, and you refer one friend, and you get $25. Come on now. TomWoods.com slash Ebates. You got to have like one friend, and you get $25. TomWoods.com slash Ebates right now. Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of the show. So glad to be talking to Walter Block today. We're talking about Milton Friedman, who has come up probably here and there in the course of the episodes, but we've never devoted an entire episode to Milton Friedman and making some kind of an evaluation of his work. And I know there will be people out there criticizing me for libertarian purism, but I'll talk to Walter about that in just a minute. That's half the fun, right? What's the point of a libertarian podcast? If you can't be a libertarian pure, if you can't be a libertarian purist on the Tom Woods show, where can you be? So anyway, you probably all know Walter Block, but he holds the Harold E. Wirth Eminent Scholar Chair in Economics at Loyola University, New Orleans. He is the author of hundreds of scholarly articles in academic journals, many books, the most famous of which is Defending the Undefendable. He's a senior fellow of the Mises Institute, and he joins us right now. Walter, welcome back to the show. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Walter, I can already hear people complaining. We haven't even started talking. I can already hear and I can already read the comments on Facebook of people who didn't listen to us, who just saw the episode title and said, you libertarian purist, you know, you can't satisfy you people. Why don't you understand? Blah, 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 blah. Ay, yeah, yeah, am I tired of these people. Yes, I understand Milton Friedman had his virtues. No one's denying that. I know he was a very skilled debater. He was a very smart guy. He was right about a lot of things, and he did a lot of good things. Nobody has to deny that. But for heaven's sake, you know, we're intellectuals. This is what we do. We do intellectual exercises. And for people who think libertarians are just too nitpicky, they have no idea what academic life is like. That's what academic life is. It's writing journal articles against some other guy until one of you dies. That's academic life. That we're not we're not subjecting Friedman to any treatment we wouldn't subject anybody else to. So having said that, those people can just leave us alone. Listen to some other episode because, Walter, you and I are going to talk about Milton Friedman, and we are going to talk about areas in which he was not as good as he might have been. Let's put it that way. So you're game for this. Well, yes, but we could preface it by saying, you know, specifying a few areas that he was excellent. Not and I would love to do that. Go ahead. Uh, for example, he was magnificent on rent control, and he, he was um, um, uh, great on uh, minimum wage and uh, good on unions and legalizing drugs and free trade. Uh, occupational licensure, uh, especially he took on the AMA and uh, capitalism and freedom, which was magnificent. Uh, he was good on social security, racial discrimination, socialized medicine, the list goes on and on. Uh, Milton Friedman was really not just good on these things, but excellent. All right. So we have said that. Now we're going to talk about some areas uh, in which there are some difficulties with Friedman. And then at the end, I am going to raise this very interesting issue, and we'll link to it on the show notes page, uh, it's tomwoods.com slash 589. We are on episode 589. So I have done more episodes than Walter has done scholarly articles. But given that each of these episodes takes a half an hour or, you know, whatever, an hour prep and whatever. But um, I want to talk about and link to your correspondence with Milton Friedman because it is very interesting to read. You obviously really got under his skin, and not for your criticisms of him so much as it was for your criticisms of Hayek. So we'll have fun with that in a little while. Let's start with the most obvious area. I think a lot of people understand that at some level, Milton Friedman obviously had a different monetary policy than the Austrians do, and than we might say a libertarian ought to have. So, uh, But then on the other hand, you can see later in his life, he did say some kind things about gold. Are you able to sort it all out for us? Well, uh, I can uh, make a hack at it. Uh, yes, you're right. Uh, there were some uh, slight differences between us Austro-Libertarians and Milton Friedman on money. 
Uh, Milton Friedman used to uh, excoriate uh, gold bugs. I remember being at Mon Pelerin meetings uh, with Barry Rothbard and Milton Friedman, and he was forever uh, criticizing us as gold bugs, gold fetishists. He make it sound as if, you know, uh, one of my favorite cartoon characters is Scrooge McDuck. Of the Donald Duck series, and uh, what Scrooge McDuck would do is get into his money bin and sort of throw cash and and coins up on his head, and you know let the money float down on him, and uh, sort of a, a a gold pervert. And that was the way Milton Friedman um, made us sound. I mean, I think it was Keynes who called it a barbarous relic. But if uh, Keynes hadn't come up with it first, Milton Friedman would have uh, uh, would have, and, and certainly uh, would uh, did agree with Keynes on that. Uh, the whole other issue, uh, uh, Milton Friedman saying that we're all Keynesians now, but uh, that's a separate issue, although not unrelated to money. Uh, Milton Friedman believed in fiat currency. Uh, he uh, wanted to have a central bank. It's true he wanted to emasculate the central bank a little bit. And he later apologized for that as being unrealistic on public choice grounds. But he wanted uh, uh, his fetish, if I could use that word, was to have a stable price level. And for Austrians, there, there are even problems with price level. But his idea was that the GDP increases by roughly 2 to 3% a year. And therefore, the Fed should increase the money supply by 2 or 3% a year, say 3%. And in that way, prices would be level. Whereas Austrians uh, don't have any uh, fetish for level prices, assuming that there is uh, any coherence in, in price indices, which there is not, uh, for Austrians, uh, we should just allow uh, the market to work. Uh, we believe in free enterprise and um, – uh, I should say libertarians, not Austrians, because uh, libertarians is uh, normative, whereas Austrians are positive economics. But uh, we all know what I mean in, in this context. So Friedman had a 3% rule that the Fed should increase the money supply or the money stock by 3% every year. And his hope and expectation would be that prices would be level. Whereas Murray Rothbard was forever saying, you know, why? what's so great about level prices? When uh, when TVs first came out, they were very expensive. When cars first were produced, they were very expensive. When computers first uh, were uh, manufactured, they were uh, tremendously expensive. I remember doing my PhD at Columbia in the, in the late 60s, and a computer was like a whole building. And now a computer, you can hold a computer in your hand. It's big as a pack of cigarettes. And the prices per calculation have gone down even further. So uh, what's wrong with um, a gently falling prices? That just means that we can have more command over uh, goods and services. So that would certainly be a stark difference between us and the Milton Friedmanites. I'm reading an article by Rothbard that I will also link on the show notes page, Milton Friedman Unraveled. And boy, this is, uh, you know, this is a 100 octane Rothbard, absolutely. But I want to read a passage to you. He says, the single most disastrous influence of Milton Friedman has been a legacy from his old Chicagoite egalitarianism, the proposal for a guaranteed annual income to everyone through the income tax system. And then I'm skipping ahead, well, although he, Rothbard said that President Nixon will undoubtedly be able to ram through the new Congress. Well, thankfully, Rothbard was not infallible. Then he says, in this catastrophic scheme, Milton Friedman has once again been guided by his overwhelming desire not to remove the state from our lives, but to make the state more efficient. He looks around at the patchwork mess of local and state welfare systems and concludes that all would be more efficient if the whole plan were placed under the federal income tax rubric and everyone were guaranteed a certain income floor. More efficient, perhaps, but also far more disastrous. And uh, I like this commentary by Rothbard. For the only thing that makes our present welfare system even tolerable is precisely its inefficiency, precisely the fact that in order to get on the dole, one has to push one's way through an unpleasant and chaotic tangle of welfare bureaucracy. The Friedman scheme would make the dole automatic and thereby give everyone an automatic claim upon production. Well, I think Rothbard's pretty much said it all, but you have anything to add to this? Oh, yes, yes. Uh, I'm inspired by Murray. It's sort of like a cadenza in music. You know, Mozart uh, puts down a few notes, and then the uh, the orchestra uh, imp improvises and, and uh, expands on that. And uh, uh, I, I think I won't say that my whole career has been <laughs> doing this for Murray, namely expanding on what he said, but uh, a, a big part of my career has been that. Uh, to just uh, give more examples and to say it in my own words, because that's sometimes helpful for me and other people. So, yes, I certainly do want to comment on that. Uh, 
Milton Friedman called this his negative income tax. In other words, uh, if you make over a certain amount of money, let's say 20,000, to just pick a number, I'm not sure this is accurate, but roughly accurate, you pay a positive income tax. But if your income is below 20,000, and the further below it is, uh, the more negative income tax you pay, that is you get money, uh, that, that's the scheme, it's called negative income tax. And uh, this is nefarious and, and highly problematic because everybody who makes less than a certain amount would be automatically uh, enrolled in this, as Murray says, whereas right now you have to go through a few hoops and hurdles to get into it. And it also, uh, although Milton Friedman wouldn't put, put it this way, it supports uh, some of our friends on the left who talk about welfare rights, that people have a right to welfare. And uh, this way, everyone gets it. And, and, you know, it's just a horrible thing. Now, the, the uh, Chicago type reasoning behind this is that um, uh, there's a diminishing margin utility of money. That is, the more money you have, the, your total happiness increases, but it increases at a decreasing rate. So your marginal happiness or your marginal utils uh, decrease. But if you're Bill Gates and you have many, many, many uh, millions, your last thousand dollars, you might even use it to light up your cigar and therefore it's uh, much less value to you. So if we take money from a rich person like Bill Gates, uh, we hardly heard him because we're taking dollars that are very, very uh, invaluable or, or not valuable. And we give it to a poor person who really relishes this. Uh, there are many, many problems with this. Uh, one of them is incentives. You know, if you take money away from rich Peter and give it to poor Paul, you reduce the incentive of both of them to earn income. Rich Peter says, well, why should I earn income if they're going to take it away from me? And you had people like Gerard Depardieu, the uh, French actor, when the marginal tax rate went up in France, he went to Belgium or Russia. You had uh, Bjorn Borg, the tennis player. Uh, they had a marginal tax rate of 110%. Uh, so if uh, in Sweden, if you make an extra 100,000, they tax you 110,000, well, Bjorn Borg went off to, I don't know, Monaco or someplace like that. Uh, so not only do you reduce the incentive of rich Peter to earn income, you reduce the incentive of poor Paul to earn income because the poorer he is, the more money he gets from the government. And if he works hard and, and, and improves his, uh, himself and now can earn income on his own, he doesn't get this money from rich Peter via the government. So it's just a disaster in, in all sorts of levels. And it assumes interpersonal comparisons of utility, namely we can compare how much Bill Gates valued uh, an extra thousand with how much a poor person valued the extra thousand, which is uh, nonsense on stilts. So the whole idea is uh, problematic from soup to nuts, from A to Z, from one end to the other. And Milton Friedman is, you know, sometimes called Mr. Libertarian, God forbid, or he's seen as a free enterprise. And then you get people say, well, even Milton Friedman, uh, namely Mr. Free Enterprise, supports this. So who are you? You must be a kook or a nut or a Rothbardian, which is <laughs> synonymous, uh, to oppose this, uh, th this wonderful view. I'm reading also in this piece about Friedman's acceptance of the perfect competition model. Oh, yes. All right. Explain about that perfect competition model and what kind of mischief can it cause? Because it might not be obvious. Well, the perfectly competitive model uh, is predicated on the fact that there are an inordinate number of firms, millions and millions of firms, or indefinitely large, infinite number of firms in the model. And uh, all goods are homogeneous, and um, uh, there are no profits. And um, uh, this is a very unrealistic uh, situation. And the real world isn't like this at all. And then what they have, uh, this, this whole idea under, undergirds or underlies or uh, defends antitrust legislation. And the idea here is that the real world isn't like that. You have concentration, namely an industry, uh, a four-firm concentration ratio or a Herfindahl index, which is a sort of a complicated thing, uh, wouldn't be like this at all with an infinite number of firms. Rather, there'd be you know, uh, one firm, and they would call it a monopoly or a duopoly with two firms, an oligopoly. And then they would come after you and, and uh, sue you on antitrust because uh, the industry didn't look like the perfectly competitive model. So they had this perfectly competitive model. Well, wait, to be fair to Milton Friedman and the Chicagoites, they were a little bit better than the Harvard-MIT group. See, what the Harvard-MIT group would say is, look, um, in the real world, uh, we have concentration ratios that are you know, high, and therefore we have, ought to have antitrust. 
uh, and and uh, antitrust here means uh, uh, since the, the prices aren't going to be or the quantities uh, produced, prices will be too high and quantities will be too low. And therefore, we have to do three, one of three things. One, we have to break them up into uh, many, many uh, firms. So you take, uh, uh, I don't know, Microsoft and break it up into 35,000 firms. And you do the same thing for every other large firm. So one is break them up. The other is nationalize them because the government wouldn't have this market failure. But we can trust the government to run everything. And the third one is regulate them. You know, just make them produce more and, and charge a lower price. So the Harvard people would say that. The Friedman people would say, well, well, you know, antitrust costs some money. And therefore, if the dead weight loss of monopoly is less than the cost of uh, – uh, of uh, operating the antitrust uh, scheme, which costs many millions of dollars, then don't have antitrust or don't use it. On the other hand, if the uh, dead weight loss, so-called the dead weight loss triangle, uh, is um, uh, uh, greater than the cost of doing it, well, then let's have antitrust. Now, you can see that this would be a full employment law for, for economists trying to figure out what this mythical dead weight loss uh, business is, a uh, uh, difference between the demand curve and the marginal cost curve uh, in between what the uh, uh, perfectly competitive model would uh, uh, predict that you would produce and what the monopolistic or uh, oligopsonistic um, industry would produce. Uh, if I had a blackboard, I could illustrate this better, but uh, let, let me just say that this, uh, this whole thing is an exercise in interpersonal comparison utility. The whole thing is dead from the neck up, and yet this is what, uh, what they do. Uh, let me tell you my antitrust joke. I must tell you my antitrust joke. Oh, Walter, no. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I know the oh, antitrust no, joke. Okay, but then I'm uh, no, no, I'm only kidding. No, no, not everybody knows the joke, so go ahead. There were three prisoners in the Soviet Union, and as prisoners do in the Gulag, they compared notes as to uh, uh, why you're there. And one guy said, well, I got to work early, and they accused me of brown nosing. And the other guy said, I got to work late, and they accused me of cheating the state out of my labor services. And the other the third guy said, I got to work every day exactly on time, and they accused me of owning a Western wristwatch. And I once told this to a bunch of antitrust lawyers and economists and I got uproarious laughter. And then I told the second part of the joke and I said there were three uh, people in jail for antitrust violations and like prisoners do, they uh, compared notes. And one guy said, well, I charged too high a price and they accused me of profiteering. The second guy said, I charged too low a price and they accused me of cutthroat competition. And the third guy said, I charged the same price as everyone else. Hard to see how he did given these other two guys, but it's just a joke. You have to work with me. And they accused me of collusion. Dead silence. Nobody was laughing. But, but the whole point is, you know, a legitimate law, like uh, the law against murder, the law against rape, the law against theft, is if you murder, rape, or steal, you go to jail. And if you don't, you don't go to jail. But here, whether you come to work early, late, or on time, or whether you charge a higher price, a lower price, or the same price, you can be found guilty. This is what they did to poor Bill Gates and Microsoft. They had a lot of nerves sitting out there in the boonies in Seattle without paying off the boys in Washington, either the Democratic boys or the Republican. They didn't pay anyone. So what they did is they uh, had an antitrust case against them. This is a way of, uh, of using crony capitalism against uh, honest businessmen. And Milton Friedman saw no uh, principled objection to it. It was based on this distinction between perfect and imperfect competition. And uh, his only uh, caveat was, well, you know, it costs something to uh, – to do this, and and if if the costs are greater than the the the, the gains in reducing the the welfare loss triangle, well then uh, you shouldn't do it. But th this is hardly a principled objection. Uh, he had no principled objection to this at all. All right, I want to talk about. I got one more thing, and then I want to talk about your infamous correspondence with Friedman. But first, a word from our sponsor. Let me tell you the story of Bad Luck Harry. Bad luck Harry thought he was going to make some passive income online by putting a few Amazon links on his blog. And he did that. And he sat there and sat there and sat there waiting for somebody to click and order a book so he could earn $2. Come on. Thank goodness you're not like bad luck Harry. Thank goodness you know about the Liberty Classroom affiliate program. Liberty Classroom is a high-quality libertarian subscription website featuring the work of great libertarian professors like Brad Berzer, Kevin Gutzman, Brian McClanahan, Bob Murphy, 
even Tom Woods, and we pay 50% commissions. These are subscription packages that run from $89 a year to $497 lifetime, and you get 50% of every sale. So forget about waiting for the two bucks from Amazon. Come on! That's bad luck, Harry. Be good luck, whatever your name is, and check out libertyclassroom.com slash affiliate. All right, so one more thing before we talk about your correspondence. He does have some sympathy for the neighborhood effects argument, the the externality argument that, uh, I mean— you know, for for negative externalities, for example, or even even positive externalities. That there's a good thing that we all recognize to be good, but we can get it for free, so we won't chip in for it. Like a public park or public education, which makes our fellow citizens smarter. That benefits us, but there's no way to collect money from us, or we won't pay for it, or we'll free ride off it, or whatever. And so, apparently, the ways in which Friedman himself was prepared to use this doctrine was in the form of urban parks and education, and so he was not willing to take it quite as far as a lot of people have taken it. But Rothbard's point is, once you basically validate this argument, there's no way to keep it confined to just those two little areas that you want to apply it to. Yes, uh, this is a good reductio ad absurdum of Murray's, uh, namely taking the logic of this and applying it to areas that uh, Milton Friedman himself wouldn't like. But even apart from the reductio, we can uh, still oppose uh, uh, the parks and the education. Uh, the idea here is that uh, take education first, then we'll do parks. The idea here is that uh, – I, uh, a student, am only concerned with my own welfare, selfish, narrow, greedy, and uh, I go to school in order to oh, get a better job, uh, have a better class of friends, meet a better spouse, uh, things like that, uh, or for the pleasure of learning. It's all internal. However, when I learn more, I benefit you, Tom, you dirty rat, and you're not paying for this uh, because I, I become a better voter. And uh, therefore, I'll benefit you, even though you don't appreciate this. Uh, you're a beneficiary. You're a free rider. Or I will be less likely to be a criminal. And therefore, I'll benefit you in that way, uh, because you'll have a safer society. And therefore, we have either none, no education in the private sector, or more reasonably, we have less than we otherwise should have. And what the government should do is uh, support education, because uh, the market, we have market failure here. And uh, for Austro-Libertarians, market failure is anathema, but we have market failure according to these guys, these uh, Friedmanite types, or Milton Friedman himself with his neighborhood effects, and we have to subsidize education by, I don't know, giving schools more money or giving uh, kids uh, more scholarships or like Bernie Sanders making it free for everybody, that sort of a thing. Now, the argument against this is, or one of the arguments, and there are several uh, against this, is look, when you buy a shirt for 25 bucks, you demonstrate, you reveal that you value that shirt more than 25 bucks. Otherwise, you wouldn't have bought it uh, in the ex ante sense. And the guy who sold you the shirt also benefits because he values that shirt less than 25 bucks. You each make a profit off of each other. You, in the Marxist sense, you each exploit each other, but in the real common sense, reasonable sense, you each benefit by voluntary trade. But in this case, it's sort of airy-fairy. How do we know that you benefit? How do we know that there are any spillover effects? Uh, maybe I won't become a better voter. I mean, uh, I mean, anyone can say, talk is cheap. Anyone can say anything he wants. Um, and uh, the point is, there is some evidence to indicate the very opposite. For example, where is minimum wage and rent control most popular? And I, let's stipulate that minimum wage and rent control are not very uh, helpful, economically speaking. And where is it most popular? Well, in the People's Republic of uh, Cambridge, Mass., in the People's Republic of Ann Arbor, Michigan, in the People's Republic of, I don't know, San Francisco or uh, L.A. or People's Republic of Manhattan. And what's, in, what's true of all these People's Republics apart from the fact that they're very liberal? you got many universities. you, you got universities up the wazoo in Massachusetts. It's just chock full of universities, and they're all a bunch of, uh, you know, Taxachusetts socialists. Well, I'm, I'm exaggerating here a little bit. The point is that what higher education consists of is all too often queer studies and feminist studies and black studies and whining studies and, and sociology and anthropology and other uh, history and uh, po political science and other philosophy subjects where they inculcate uh, – 
uh, the wrong views uh, to their students. And, and what they're doing is miseducating them. So instead of an external economy or a positive externality, a case could equally be made that we ought to tax, God forbid, I'm not advocating this, but uh, instead of a benefit uh, where there are free riders, this is a, a negative and we ought to tax it or get rid of education. Namely, anyone can say anything he damn well pleases. Now, let's take the park, uh, a private park. I live right near Audubon Park in um, in New Orleans and in New York City, the Central Park. And suppose that when I put in a park, uh, what I'm going to do is increase the real estate values of all the surrounding areas because of the amenities of the park. But only I know where I'm going to put the park. You don't know. I Only I know. So what I do is I buy, uh, say, uh, a square mile, and I'm only going to put the park in a, a, a quarter mile squared. And then I will benefit from the surrounding increase in property values because only I know where it's going to be. So I will internalize the externalities. That would be the argument against the government uh, uh, supporting parks or libraries or anything else like that. Now, negative externalities uh, are uh, the very opposite thing, and here you get the, the usual cases, pollution. Uh, but Murray Rothbard would say it's not a negative externality. It's, it's um, what do you call it, trespass. Only instead of trespassing a person on someone else's property, you're trespassing uh, smoke particles or dust particles or whatever is crap through the air, garbage. And uh, Murray's answer to that properly, uh, uh, I uh, strongly agree with Murray on this, and as on most things, is uh, to stop the trespass. And that yet the government, uh, which uh, sets itself up as the monopoly of law and order, uh, for many years uh, in the progressive period, wouldn't do it. It would say it's not actionable. And Murray Rothbard wrote one of the best pieces on environmental economics ever. Uh, I'll change that. Not one of the best. The best thing ever written on environmental economics. Uh, it's a thing called uh, air pollution. It was originally in the Cato Journal in 1982, and I use it in all my environmental economics classes. And Murray makes the case that uh, pollution is not an externality; it's just a good old trespass. And if you, uh, if we had a, a, a law and order uh, worthy of the name, they, they would stop it. But uh, the government didn't, and they call it a market failure. It's not a market failure; it's a government failure to uphold the law of private property rights after setting themselves up as a monopolist of this. All right. Now I want to talk about that correspondence you had with Milton Friedman. Uh, Tom, let me, let me interrupt you. Before, before we go there, I just want to list the other things where Milton Friedman is weak on. Oh, on oh yeah, sure. I would never want to interrupt that. Just briefly list it because you and I have now covered four or five, but I've got a list of about 15. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Probably don't have time to cover them all, but if ever you want to do another show on Milton, we can do some of these other things. Uh, the volunteer military, uh, which I oppose. Uh, it's a little convoluted reasoning, but um, he favored the volunteer military for the wrong reasons. They would make the U.S. military more efficient, and, and they were doing bad things in Vietnam. Uh, tax withholding, road socialism, he favored uh, government roads. Uh, he, um, he favored free to choose. He even had a free to choose series, and yet when people were free to choose, they chose gold, and, and yet he rejects that. He also favored flexible exchange rates and international trade. Uh, he supported uh, Ronald Coase on social cost, and the, the, that was wrong. Or, and he also said, we are all Keynesians now, and, and he meant it, and he really was a Keynesian, although a lot of people distinguish monetarism from Keynesianism, but it's all Keynesianism. Uh, he, um, he favored educational vouchers, which is something that um, stuck in Murray's craw. And, um, and um, he had the, he opposed justice. Uh, I once uh, had a little debate with him, and, and I asked him, what's your passion for justice? Where does it emanate from? And he said, the search for justice will ruin the world. So these are maybe six or seven other things that we could uh, elaborate on if we had more time. But since you want to go to my correspondence over Hayek, uh, let's do that. Oh, I, I really do. Because when I, I read it, first of all, I, I couldn't get over how nasty he was. Just a nasty guy came through in this correspondence, and you were sweet throughout. I'm a sweetie pie. <laughs> so anyway, you, so you, I think, handled yourself really well in it. Uh, but, I mean, the gist of it was that you were very critical of Hayek for some of the things that he had said in The Road to Serfdom and maybe also Constitution of Liberty, I, I don't know, but in which he clearly is saying things that are at odds with 
you know, libertarianism as we understand it, so you were calling him to task for that. I mean, taking him to task for that. Now, uh, you obviously respect Hayek's work in other areas, and uh, but that just because you respect somebody's work in some place doesn't give them a free pass in everything else they write. So that was your your point. And Friedman just a just couldn't believe he called it a diatribe. He couldn't get over what you had written. And didn't you understand that, you know, realistic and reasonable people like Milton Friedman and F.A. Hayek are always pondering how the practical means of getting from here to there will work. And you just have misread Hayek because he he wasn't saying any of those interventions were ideal. He was He was thinking in terms of transitions. And a fanatic like you, Walter, can't ever think in that way. I Before we critique that, did he just write to you out of the blue? Yes. Really? He started it. Um, uh, I wrote a, an essay, I think it was in the Journal of, of Libertarian Studies, saying that I revere Hayek as an Austrian economist. He made uh, wonderful contributions to Austrian business cycle theory. And uh, he uh, was a very good Austrian, a follower of Mises, uh, uh, a good student of Mises. But as a libertarian, uh, he was a little wanting. I mean, he was giving away the store in The Road to Serfdom. I mean, there were some good chapters in The Road to Serfdom, why the worst get on top and all. But, you know, he was sort of saying, well, yeah, we should get rid of rent control, but we should phase it out. And, uh, you know, it seems to me that if we have the power to uh, get rid of rent control and we keep it for 10 years and phase it out one 10% every year, we're guilty of keeping uh, rent control in it. And I think I use the example of slavery. Obviously, we're against slavery, even though the New York Times doesn't think I favor that. But if we have the power to eliminate slavery right now, and uh, instead we phased it out over 10 years, we would be responsible for slavery for nine years or for 90% of the ninety percent of the people for nine years or whatever the numbers work. Right, but what if he said we only have the political strength to phase it out over 10 years? Isn't that better than doing nothing? Oh, absolutely, yes. But Hayek didn't say that. He didn't say, you know, we in our heart of hearts, we really want to get rid of it right now. Uh, minimum wage, the same thing, uh, free trade. We really want to have uh, full free trade right now, but we don't have the power. And therefore, we want to phase it out over 10 years, I would have no objection to that. Murray would have no objection to that. Uh, Murray, was, Murray really contradicted himself. Uh, he uh, once favored the, um, I'm kidding here, he uh, once favored the budget of George Washington. He said he would be happy with the budget of George Washington, <laughs> you know, 35000 a year or something like that. But he, even Murray there said as a first step. So, you know, if, uh, you know, look, when Ron Paul was a congressman, he was Dr. No, and he would always vote against any uh, complicated bill as long as it had one bad thing in it. But if the bill was unambiguously good, namely reducing tax rates or reducing jail sentences for marijuana people, uh, victimless crimes, he would vote in favor of that. So we don't, uh, we radical libertarians uh, do not oppose uh, teeny tiny steps in the right direction, as long as they're unambiguous teeny tiny steps in the right direction. But we always say that this is a, a second best policy. We, the ideal is to say eliminate uh, all uh, laws against the uh, marijuana, med not just medical marijuana, but recreational marijuana, sort of like they did in uh, Colorado and uh, Washington State, I think, and maybe Oregon and a few others. Uh, but if we could uh, phase it out over five or 10 years, that's okay. But that's not what Hayek said. What Hayek said is that it, it's bad. You know, We should oppose getting rid of rent control because it would be too disruptive or something like that. But I, actually, Walter, I think, it's, I think your case is even stronger and and, and Hayek's is even weaker than you're giving him credit for because the in the road to serfdom, he just clearly says that there is no reason that in our advanced societies we can't make provision for some kind of basic income or basic floor beneath which no one should fall. He was not saying, well, this would be an interesting transition move uh, between here and no welfare state at all. He clearly was not saying that. So I liked how you responded to Friedman when you said, well, look, I went back and reread The Road to Serfdom, and you say I'm misreading him, but I in no way and in no place in this book do I find anything in which he claims he's talking about second best measures or transitional measures. He's clearly talking about what he thinks is the right thing to do, including having a basic income. Well, I think you're right there on the basic income. I was talking about minimum wage and... Uh, right. And 
Right, but the basic income is where it's just so clear no, no. that he's not thinking about no. any transition. That's his policy. That's right. It's right. Uh, a more efficient uh, welfare system instead of uh, Milton Friedman called it rags in a bag and we should have the negative income tax or something like that. Well, Hayek was a, a Friedmanian on this issue or Friedman was a Hayekian on this issue. I think Hayek was a little older than Friedman. But uh, uh, you're right. Uh, I was only talking about transition on rent control, minimum wage and things like that and maybe free trade. But on, on the welfare system, Hayek uh, never said that we, uh, our ultimate goal is to get rid of the welfare system, but you know, we can only get rid of uh, a little bit, so let's phase it out. He never said that. He said that in a, in a decent society, a government will have a, a, a girding under uh, income such that no one falls below this uh, social safety net or whatever, uh, whatever he put it in terms of. So you're absolutely right that on certain things, Hayek is not uh, phasing out anything. He was supporting it. So how did you guys leave it in your correspondence? Because th this went on. I mean, he, he kept responding to you when you would write to him. Yes, yes. And, you know, this occurred many years ago when I was a young pup. And um, uh, so I was sort of honored that the great Milton Friedman uh, was uh, condescending to argue with me. And uh, so I, I uh, kept it up. And we had, oh, four or five or six interchanges. And I think the way it ended, as he said, you know, you're a... Uh, an extremist or, uh, you know, a, a, a rabid person or something like that. A, a fanatic. fanatic. I think it was a fanatic. That was, yeah. that was the word he used. And I said, your son, David Friedman, is also an anarchist. Would you consider him a fanatic? And he never replied. Is that the... <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, was that where the correspondence broke off? Yes, yes. I, I uh, hit below the belt. <laughs> oh, my gosh. I've had David Friedman on the show a couple of times, as a matter of fact. And I... If I'm remembering correctly, I don't think I once asked him, well, I might have mentioned his father, but he must get, you know, I'm sure he's proud of his father and everything, but I mean, he is his own person. It must get a little tiresome to always be introduced as the son of Milton Friedman, so I, I think I tried to avoid that. Well, anyway, I, I'm going to link to your stuff. You know, I know of several of your articles on Friedman. We'll link to that. We'll link to the Rothbard article on Friedman. I will also link to Roger Garrison's article on whether... Uh, Friedman could be considered a Keynesian, because that's also very interesting. This will all be at tomwoods.com slash 589. And if you'd like to learn more about Walter Block, you can just go to walterblock.com. Any final words? Uh, Tom, thanks for having me on your show. It's always a pleasure, and I'm looking forward to seeing you at the Mises uh, University and uh, Austrian Economic Research uh, Conference, if you'll be there. It'll be uh, great to see you again, old friend. It's always a pleasure to see you too, Walter. Thanks for your time. My pleasure. All right, that's going to do it for another episode. TomWoods.com slash 589 is the place to go for resources related to this episode. we got a fun one coming up tomorrow with Ron Unz. I don't want to give it away. Now, you know what? I do want to give it away. I do want to give it away. Ron Unz is running a kind of a campaign against some of the practices of Harvard University. Now, of course, Harvard University is a private institution. I get it. I know that. But it doesn't mean just because you're a libertarian, you can't criticize people, right? You just If you're a lazy bum, you're not physically aggressing against anybody, but I can still criticize you for being a lazy bum. I am allowed to do that as a libertarian. Well, likewise, you're allowed to say Harvard is doing things that it shouldn't do. So Ron Unz is, has got a twofold campaign. One is against their affirmative action program, but the second one is he's saying that when you look at the amount of money that Harvard earns from its endowment, and then you compare it to how much it earns from tuition payments, it might as well just get rid of tuition payments and let everybody in for free. Ah, very interesting. So he's actually got a massive campaign <laughs> in place. And, you know, Ron's an influential guy, so this actually has legs, and he's actually brought a lot of people on board. Very, very interesting. So we're going to talk to Ron Unz tomorrow. Thanks for listening, everybody. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit TomWoods.com to subscribe to the show for free, and we'll see you next time.